Turn turning your Bibles with me, please, to Acts chapter 2. Today is Pentecost Sunday. It's a great day of the church, a great day in Scripture. A lot of things happened on this day in the Scriptures. Pentecost was a major feast of the Jews. It was the feast of the Jews that men were required to make a pilgrimage to the city of Jerusalem. It's interesting if you continue to read in Acts chapter 2 to see all the nations that were represented in Jerusalem that day. Typically, on the, the feast days, Jerusalem, the population of Jerusalem would expand to almost a million people. And um, so it was crowded, the streets were crowded. People were camped out uh, outside of town, and excuse me, there we go. Um, so it, it was quite a lot of excitement, and it was the day for whatever reasons. It was also called the Feast of Harvest. Okay, they celebrated the gathering of the wheat harvest. It was the end of the wheat harvest, and the Feast of Pentecost was a day, a feast of weeks, a feast, of, and and remember that Pentecost. The word Pentecost means 50, because Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, happened 50 days after Passover, okay? And, um, and that's all it means, is 50. So don't be afraid of it, okay? So let's read, and in, 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 I want to read the first three verses. There's three things that I want to talk about. Now, if you have one of those um, outlines, my guess is I might make it halfway through the outline, Okay, and uh, I, I, I don't want to scare anybody with this, but I told Chris, I said, I really need about three hours with this because there's so much that happens, just these first three verses. And, uh, and it's very significant um, to, to each and every one of our lives. So verse one of chapter two, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Now, I got to admit, I'm going to stop. After standing in my house listening to the derecho for 45 minutes, I have a whole new appreciation for this phrase, a rushing mighty wind. <laughs> it just means something different to me today than it did prior to the derecho because there is a force to that wind that was above and beyond anything that I had ever experienced before. So, okay, so, there, and, and, and that, that wind did something. It didn't just blow around. There was stuff that moved. There was stuff, matter of fact, I've said to Chris, I gotta tell you this part, and we'll get back to that. The last few months that we've had other times where the wind has been 30 and 40 miles an hour, there hasn't been much damage, at least in our neighborhood. There have been a few branches down. We have one tree left in our front yard and there must be some dead stuff up in there because stuff always comes down. But I'm convinced that everything that was weak behind us, and there's a lot behind us, that everything that was weak after that derecho, it's gonna withstand anything. And so we don't have, I don't have too much fear about those things coming down. It'd be quite the wind for those things to come down. Okay, let me come back. And suddenly, verse 2, there came a, a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Now there's three things that happen in these three verses on this day of Pentecost. And it's very significant. All three of them are very significant. Number one is that they were all in one accord. They were all in agreement. They weren't all dressed the same. They didn't all look the same. They, they, some were tall, some were short, some were men, some were women, some were young, some were old. They were all different, kind of like us this morning. Okay, we're all different. But we have one purpose, and our purpose is to serve God somehow in some way, and we've identified ourselves with this body of believers to fulfill the purpose of serving God, to fulfill the purpose of reaching out 
and, 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 and affecting the lives of other people. We've talked before about how that, that God said, Jesus said to the disciples in Acts chapter 1, that, that, that when the Holy Spirit came, that they would be given power to be witnesses. And it wasn't just to be witnesses at home. They were to be witnesses in Jerusalem, which was home, and in, and in, and in Samaria and Judea. And then it says, to the ends of the earth. And we have some from us, a part of our body, the Hunts and, and the Randalls, who have chosen to be witnesses in Taiwan and South Africa. And we have other people that have chosen to be witnesses through many, many other organizations. The impact or the potential impact of this church in this county and even in other counties is huge. That wherever you go, you have the power because of the Holy Spirit being in you. You have the power to make a difference, to be a witness to somebody, someplace, somehow, in some way. Now you just stop and think about that. I've, I've, I've thought about this a lot, that, that every place we go, every place you go. Now just for the fun of it, start thinking about all the places you were yesterday. Start thinking about all the places that you might be tomorrow, if God gives you tomorrow. In your workplace, at the coffee shop. And please, in Walmart, somehow, in some way. <laughs> you have the opportunity to be a witness. You have the opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life. Now, we're obviously not a large church, and there aren't a lot of us here. But just think about all the places that we're all going to be tomorrow. In a doctor's office. In a lawyer's office. And I hope only for good reasons. In school. In your workplace. With your neighbors. At the gas station, if you come in contact with people there is that you have the opportunity, God has already given you the power to make a difference in somebody's life. And that's an important thing for us um, um, to be. I wrote some scriptures down for you because this is, this, this idea of one accord or being in agreement, that's pretty rare in our world today. There's not a lot of agreement out there. And the disagreement is pretty ugly, violent at times. We're seeing that every day in our nation. All I have to do is watch the news. The disagreements are, are, are violent. They're full of hateful words. They're disrespectful. And it's all on both sides of the fence, both sides of whatever argument. And so I wrote some scriptures here for you to, to take it to, into consideration is that, that Philippians chapter 2 verse 3 that Paul writes, he says, we need to value one another over ourselves. How you doing with that? I think some of us have some problems with that. Because for some of us, our, we're it, man. And if you're not like me, there's something wrong with you if you're not like me. If you don't think like I do, there's something wrong with you. You don't do what I want you to do. There's something wrong with you. And that's not what the scriptures say. The scriptures say that we value one another. And that I'd be willing to lay down what I want in order to support you. i tell you a great story. This is on me. Several years ago, I had the privilege of leading a large men's ministry uh, here in Lynn County. We had dinners every month that have 200, 250 people. We had pro athletes. Ron Gonder would come, Big Shoe would come and, and, and speak to us. And he was a regular and, and, and just great things. Uh, uh, and Jess Settles and others that would come from the University of Iowa and, and athletes. We had, we had a guy in our church who was a professional. This would blew me away, but it was true. He was a professional fisherman. He won awards. He, he would go to contests. He was a guide. He, and out we had former, uh, we had one of the, uh, oh, Hilgenberg's 
the, I think it was Wally that passed away from uh, um, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. We had Wally just not long after he had been diagnosed with it, and he came and spoke, and, and we had a great time. We had two, 250 guys come every month for dinner. We had cook teams, we had cleanup teams, we had set up teams, we had prayer teams, and it was a great thing. I met with the leadership of that group once a month, 20 guys. We spent a couple of hours together, one, one, one night a month around pizza, okay? And, uh, and so one night we were brainstorming about what could we do besides the dinners. And one guy, and I told the story downstairs at nine o'clock, but one guy says, I would like to see us go Christmas caroling. Now, I'll tell you a secret. That would not be in the top 150 things for me to sign up for, to do. Somehow or other, I kept my mouth shut, which was a major miracle, okay, all right? And one of the guys in the group, a guy that I had just recently baptized because he came to faith in Jesus, he came and, and he, was, he was married and he had a couple of kids, but his wife didn't want anything to do with church and wouldn't send the kids. And, 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 and Corey was, was try, looking for things to try to get Jess to come to church. <clears throat> and he's sitting there and he hears Christmas caroling. He says... And I'm inside going, come on, no way, ever, come on, get out of here. And he says, my wife would love to go Christmas caroling. And I looked at him and I looked at the other guys in the group and I said, I like Christmas caroling. And I'll tell you what happened. Jess came. She connected with a couple of other couples. She got saved. She started coming to church. She started attending classes. She started growing in the Lord. And within a year, she was teaching Sunday school. She was brilliant. She was creative. She was growing every day. They still um, serving God together as a husband and wife. They've raised um, a bunch of boys, and their boys are all love the Lord and all doing great things for God. And, and, and I often wonder... I got to admit to you, I kind of shudder with, if I had put my foot down and said, Christmas caroling, no way. But that's what God jets in. That same night, the same conversation, a little bit later, one of the guys said, we should plan a night for bowling. Now, Christmas caroling would be about 150 on my list. Bowling would be between 90 and 100, okay? Not a big fan of bowling. Kept my mouth shut. The guy to my left says, I got six guys from my workplace. He worked for Nash Finch. At that time, it was still open. He says, I got six guys that would come for a night of bowling. All I'd have to do is invite them. And I said, I like bowling. And you know what? He brought six guys with him when they went bowling. I stayed back and made sure their food and everything was ready and had a great time. And some of those guys kept coming to church. Not all of them, but some of them kept coming to church. And Jess kept coming to church. And, and, and it was great. Because I laid down my preferences in, to benefit somebody else. You may have to do that in order to make an impact on somebody else's life. In Psalm 133, verse 1, it says that, we're, that, 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 that it's blessing to live in unity. And unity doesn't mean that we always agree, but unity says that it's okay to disagree, but it's not okay to be disagreeable. How many have heard that before? Now let me ask you a tough question. How many live that every day? You ever disagreeable? I won't ask anybody else, okay? I'm asking you, that's your question. I won't ask your spouse, I won't ask your kids, I won't ask your parents. You ever been disagreeable? Stop it. Quit being disagreeable. It's okay to disagree. Matter of fact, I kind of like it sometimes when people disagree because they have a different perspective on things. They don't always see things the way that I do. Sometimes they see them in a much better way than I do. It wouldn't take much for some of us to start thinking about things that we enjoy doing, 
but back before we started doing them, did we honestly think we would enjoy doing them? Maybe somebody suggested we go here, we go there, we eat this food, that food, we go see this movie or we go to this concert or whatever, and it was something that we didn't think we would like, but once we laid down our personal preferences and we cooperated with the program, all of a sudden we found something else that we enjoyed doing way more than what we thought we would enjoy. You ever have that happen? But you know what? If we stick to only what I like, it's going to get pretty boring fast. Is that we need to live in unity. We need to, to, to be able to handle somebody disagreeing with us. A number of years ago, I was president of the Lynn County Association of Evangelicals. I had an executive team. There was not one member of that executive team from my church. I made sure that they were from all different churches in the community. They had different practices. They believed some things differently than, than what I did. And we, we, we practiced this of being able to disagree without being disagreeable. Matter of fact, by the time I got about halfway through, it was a two-year term, I got about halfway through my first year, I looked forward to the executive team meetings more so than I looked forward to the group meetings. We had about 100, 125 people would come to the monthly meetings. We had about uh, 10 uh, people on the executive team, all from different churches, from different traditions. And I loved it because they challenged me. They made me think about why I believe a certain way and why I, I do this or why I do that. I needed their other voices in my ears. Not everybody in my church was happy that I was with these people, but I was delighted to be with these. I was, I was blessed by being with these people. So we need to live in unity. Psalm, or Romans chapter 12 says we need to live in harmony. We need to get along with one another. All right? And I would take that word harmony uh, a little bit further. We need to enjoy the differences that one another brings to the table. The experiences, the traditions. We need to be able to enjoy those things. And, and then the Matthew 7, 12, this causes a lot of problems for some of us. We need to treat one another the way we want them to treat us. How you doing with that? Does everything have to be my way or the highway? It's a lot of people live that way. Or are we willing to treat one another the way we want to be treated? Am I willing to treat you in the way that I want you to treat me? Am I willing to respect you the way that I want you to respect me? And it's crucial. Matter of fact, I'm going to go so far as to say if the scriptures tell us to do it and we don't do it, it's sinful. It will endanger your relationship with God over a period of time. If God says that it's a good thing for us to value others above ourselves, to not value other people is sinful. We just prayed the Lord's Prayer. We said, may your will be done here on the earth as it is in heaven. We ask for the values of heaven to become our values. Heaven loves everybody. Heaven respects everybody. And on I again ask the question, how are we doing with that? And sometimes it's not just the people that go to another church or believe a different way. That's not the issue. Sometimes it's in our own family. Sometimes it's in our own church. Sometimes it's in our own classes and our workplaces. We've just got to sit back and ask ourselves some hard, hard questions. Because you see, on the day of Pentecost, if those people had not been in agreement, Pentecost wouldn't have happened. Not that day. The presence of God wouldn't have come in in the form of wind or in the form of that fire if they'd just been arguing and say, well, this has got to be this way and I'm insisting that this is the way and all of my wisdom. And besides that, I, I gave a lot of money in the offering last week and so you guys need to do what I want. That's an immediate disqualification from the kingdom of God. So on the day of Pentecost when it says that they were in one accord, what a great picture 
They were in harmony. They were loving towards one another, even the ones they didn't agree with. Now, stop and think with me. Now, we don't know who all was in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. We're not even sure where the upper room is. I think I know. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. So we don't know who all was there. I'm fairly certain that 11 of the 12 disciples were there. I'm fairly certain that Peter was there, Andrew was there, that John was there, that Thomas was there. I'm fairly certain that Mary was there, the mother of Jesus, that James and John, the sons of thunder, who said to Jesus when they didn't get treated right, you want us to call lightning down from heaven and burn them? They were all up there. And so there's all these bigger than life personalities there. There was Andrew, Peter's brother. I wonder if they argued. Mom always liked you better than me. Or you always got to have your way. You think you're so smart. I wonder if they got along. Right? I know they did in the upper room because the Bible says they were in one accord. They laid down their differences. They celebrated one another. They were in unity. They said, we don't know what God's got, but we want what God's got. And on that day, because of the unity, there came into that room a rushing, mighty wind. And it was cool. Now, I remember one time when I was a kid, after a Pentecost Sunday, I asked my dad, why was there wind? And why was there fire? And he had great answers for me. I want to tell you that. I want to talk for just a few minutes here about why was there wind, okay? And I want you to turn to these scriptures. We didn't do it with the first set, but I want you to turn to these scriptures. The Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Let's go back to the very beginning because the scripture, if we allow the scriptures to, they will uh, define for us what's being said. Okay? So if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, and this is part of the creation account. And while you turn to Genesis 2, well, let's, let me, let's just read Genesis 2. And the Lord God formed man of the dust, dirt, of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. I had a friend who said that if God hadn't have breathed into Adam, Adam would have stayed a dirt ball all of his life. But God breathed the breath of life into Adam. God breathed his wind, his spirit, his breath into Adam, and Adam came to life. Now let me, let's talk about that. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, had, there's a Hebrew name for the Holy Spirit. And, and, and it's, it's kind of fun to say, uh, I'll, I'll have you say it with me, it's called... Um, 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 Ruach HaKodesh okay Ruach, you gotta have a hawker back here okay, so so say that with me Ruach, Ruach, Ruach. alright, you can just don't do it on the next person on the person next to you right? Ruach, that means wind and Ha is next and so Ruach, Ha Ha is the word the so it's backwards in Hebrew. We'll flip it in just a minute. But we got wind, ruach, ha is the holy is Kodesh. Kodesh, say Kodesh. Kodesh. Ruach, ha, Kodesh. English, it would be the holy wind. The holy wind. And we're introduced to the holy wind actually in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. Right? Because that's the Holy Spirit. Okay? And the wind, God had wind, wind energy in mind long before we ever did. Okay? Because it was the energy of the Holy Wind 
that brought creation into existence. Okay? It was the wind, it was the energy of the wind that did away with chaos and brought order. And it was the Ruach HaKodesh, the holy wind of God, that took Adam from this dirt clod to a living being. And the same thing was true for Eve, that God had to breathe life into her, his breath, his life into to, 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 to her. And so it, it was really cool. Now I want, you to, I want you to see the wind of God in action again, and, and this time turn way over to Ezekiel chapter 37 in the first three verses. Way, I don't know if I've ever had to read from Ezekiel uh, before uh, in all my years here. So uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, and this is a familiar story. If you don't know the story, you've heard the song, Them Dry Bones. Okay? So here's, we're going to stay in 37 for just a little bit. The hand of the Lord came upon me, in verse 1, and brought me out in the spirit. The prophet Ezekiel is talking. Brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley. And it was full of bones. Can you imagine that? It was full of bones. And then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And indeed, they were very dry. They'd been dried and dead for a long time. Now there is nothing but bones. And God said to me, son of man, can these bones live? What a great question. Here you are, you're knee deep in skeletal remains. Actually, if you keep reading in the picture and you understand what's going on, God is showing the prophet Ezekiel a picture of Israel. Because Israel had been dead in their sin. Israel had been dead. They were in exile and captivity. Uh, they, were, they were not ruling over themselves. They were, they were dead. And so God puts Ezekiel in the midst of them. He's knee deep in bones that are bleached and dry and brittle. And he says, Ezekiel, son of man. That's what he called him a lot. Can these bones live? Verse 5. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath, wind, ruach ha-kodesh, to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you. I will cover you with skin and put breath, ruach ha-kodesh, in you. And you shall live. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I was commanded. And, I, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. I love this. And suddenly a rattling. What was rattling? Dry bones. Dry bones coming together. Remember? The foot bone connected to the ankle bone. And the ankle bone connected to the leg bone. And the leg bone connected to the knee bone. And there were, they made noises because they were dry. They were brittle. They'd been laying out there in the sun. They'd been dead a long, long time. And suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. It's like a lot of people that you and I come in contact with. They're, they're, they're just existing. There's no life. You ever been around somebody like that? You kind of want to shake them and say, hey, you in there? It's time to get a life. Anybody ever tell you that? It's time to get a life. I want to tell people that sometimes. Get a life. Not a wife. Get a life. Okay? Now drop down to verse 9. And also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, to the whole, to the Ruach HaKodesh. Prophesy to the Holy Spirit. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived, and they stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. I love that. 
I love that. What a, what a, what a great uh, picture that is, that, that here they were, they were, they were dead. Matter of fact, look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 with me. This time flip over to the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. We've talked about this before, but I want you to see it again. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul's writing to the church in Ephesians. is probably the largest church in the world at that time. Probably 25,000 people in this church in Ephesians. In Ephesus, the city. And in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, You used to be dead in your sin. You used to be like those dry bones in Ezekiel. You used to be dead, but now, because the Holy Spirit has come in you, you're alive. You're not dead. You're not a dirt ball, but you're alive. And you have hope, and you have peace, and you have power, and you have the Holy Spirit living and, 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 and existing inside of you and guiding you in, in the ways that you should go. There's no room for chaos because the Ruach HaKodesh, the holy wind of God, is in you. The breath of God. I forgot to tell you this. In the Old Testament, it was called Ruach HaKodesh, the holy wind of God. In the New Testament, it's just one word, and it's really an easy word. It was called pneuma. We get pneumonia. Okay? The word is breath. It's life. You can breathe in. That's the pneuma. That's the breath, that's the air that keeps my lungs going, that keeps me going. And the Holy Spirit is referred to as the pneuma, the, 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 the pneuma of God, the breath, the wind of God, the breath of God. Let me take that even further. The life that God has for you and for me. It's a powerful picture that we used to be dead in our sin. We used to be dead like that valley of dry bones in Ezekiel chapter 37. We used to be just a dirt ball until God breathed into us the Ruach HaKodesh and made us alive and gave us hope, chased away the chaos. And we get to celebrate the life that God has for each and every one of us. I think I'm gonna stop there. Day of Pentecost. Energized the church. Brought life to the church like they had never experienced before. And there were miracles that happened. There were lives changed. I don't know if we'll take the time in, a, in the next few weeks or not, but you can go through and read the rest of Acts chapter 2 and see how lives were changed, see how Peter's life was changed. And there were thousands and thousands of people there from other parts of the world who heard the gospel in their own languages because the wind of God was at work. I love the picture of the fire of God that happens in verse 3, but we'll talk about that next week. It's, a, it's an incredible picture that, that we know. And then God reverses. In verse 4, we have the miracle of other tongues, of other languages being spoken. God reverses. I'll give you a tease. In Genesis chapter 10, is the story of the Tower of Babel. There was one language in the world. But because of the sinfulness of mankind in building the tower and the way that it was built, even the things that it was constructed with, God confused the tongues. He confused the language so that on that day when the Tower of Babel was constructed, they couldn't communicate with one another. But then, when they came into unity, the wind of God came in, and the fire of God, and we'll talk more about that next week. The result of the wind of God, which did away with chaos, the fire of God, which, which, which was the presence of God in the lives of his people, the curse of the Tower of Babel was reversed. 
and that all of these people from all of these nations, and there's at least 10 different nations, 10 different languages, 10 different people groups, heard the message of Jesus that day on the day of Pentecost in their own language. There was one language that day, and it was the language of the Spirit. And the gospel was proclaimed to these nations like never before. Because you see, that was what was promised in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, that you would receive power, you would receive authority, you would receive expertise, you would receive the enablement to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. I've, I've been privileged, and I think Chris was with me one time, to hear a gentleman speak who had been a missionary all of his life. Most of his life had been in the jungles with prehistoric tribes. Matter of fact, they were so backward and so uh, contrary to the things of God that they practiced cannibalism. And they, they thought in the story of Jesus' death and resurrection that Judas was actually the hero because he had gotten Jesus to trust him to the point where he could betray him. That was their culture. And Don Richardson is, is, is trying to find a way to communicate the gospel to them. And he spends a lifetime living up in the trees. It's an incredible story. He spends a lifetime living in these, spends a lifetime with, with this prehistoric tribes and languages that he'd never heard before, and languages that had never been put in writing before, and languages that had no alphabet or no books, no words or anything like that. And, 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 and he's looking for a way to find a way to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the way that he did was that God helped him, the Holy Spirit guided him to tell the story of Jesus being born and of Jesus becoming an offering, a sacrifice for the lives of other people. And the Holy Spirit enabled Don Richardson, if you can ever read the book called Peace Child, do it. If you ever get to see the movie, Peace Child, watch it. It's a privilege to sit in the same room with this man to hear him tell all these stories. And after I'd read the book, and I don't, I think I'd seen the movie, and it was like, to hear him talk about how the Holy Spirit enabled him to find a way to preach the gospel. Because that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. That the Holy Spirit enabled people, empowered people to share the gospel in ways that never even dreamed of you. And I'm convinced, I heard uh, Mark Batterson say this a few years ago, and, 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 and I, I remember when he said it, there was just something inside of me that jumped. I don't know what it was, but there was something inside of me, and I'm, I'm convinced it was the Holy Spirit. He said, pay attention. Batterson said, this is probably 10, 12, maybe 15 years, and I lose track of time. It was in the early 2000s, so 25 years ago. Mark said, there are ways that we're going to do church in the future that hasn't even been invented yet. Hasn't even been thought about yet. Those of you that are watching online, who are watching on YouTube, you're benefiting from things that 25 years ago hadn't been thought of yet. Who knew? There are other things that, that we benefit from, and I'm convinced that we're going to see another wave of ways to do church like we've never seen before. Because I'm convinced that the same Ruach HaKodesh that raised a valley of dry bones back to life that breathed life into a dirt ball and made him alive, that came into that day of Pentecost, into that room with 120 people whose personalities were as different as night and day, and he brought unity. And he sent them out around the world. 
He sent them down the street. He sent them into their workplaces. He sent them into their schools. He sent them everywhere they were going to make disciples and to preach the gospel. I shouldn't have used the word preach because that would scare you to death. You don't have to preach. You just have to be salt and light. Okay? And I'm convinced that we haven't even begun to see the ways that the Holy Spirit is going to enable us to present the gospel here even. I don't know what God's got in store. I'm just excited and, and convinced that he's got some things in store for us that we don't know about yet. And that's cool because I trust him. I trust him. He wants this church to grow more than I do and that's an awful, awful lot. He wants your co-workers to know him as their savior more than you do. He wants your kids to know him as their savior more than you do. He wants your parents to know him as their savior more than you do. He wants those neighbors, even though they're miles apart, he wants them to know him more than you do. And so Father, I ask now that you would guide us and Holy Spirit, we invite you to come into our lives. It may not be as dramatic as it was on the day of Pentecost. That's okay. But it's the same Spirit. And I invite you, Holy Spirit, to come and to bring us to life. Because some of us have been dead for a while. We've been drying out like those bones in the valley. Some of us go back and forth from being alive to being dead, from being a dirt ball to being breathing. So guide us, help us, help us where we think of others more so than we think of ourselves. We treat others in a way that brings honor and glory to you. We lay down our preferences in order for your kingdom to come and your will to be done here on the earth as it is in heaven. We ask that you help us to align ourselves with your ways above and beyond anything we've ever been able to imagine. And so, Holy Spirit, you are welcome, not only in our church, the Holy Spirit, you are welcome in our lives, each and every one of us, to come and to move, to bring the things that you desire, to do away with the things that ought not to be. And we'll give you praise and we'll give you thanks for that now in the name of Jesus. Amen.